You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This week, I'm very pleased to have a special guest to interview. It's Phoenix Serin, the author of the blog, Five Years Abroad. Hi, Phoenix. Hi, Jake. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Uh, fantastic. It's, it's great to be able to connect. I'm speaking from uh, Puerto Escondido in Mexico, and where are you now? Uh, I'm currently in Santiago de Chile. Awesome. Well, I think you've got a great blog and you know, really interesting experience that, uh, that you're undertaking at the moment, but for people who don't know anything about you, could you explain a little bit about your background? Sure thing. So the story really begins late 2010. I was, I guess, statistically what you might call a typical American. Um, I was living in the United States at the time. I didn't have a passport. My work was in the United States. My investments were in the U.S. And yeah, I don't know. I kind of figured I'd spend my whole life there and maybe take an international trip. But to be honest, I'd be just as happy with Hawaii. I mean, it's such a big, scary world out there. <laughs> and uh, uh, one day I was coming, I was on a forum board and I came across this thread and it was entitled Sovereign Man, Is This Guy Real? And I thought, oh, that's such an innocuous sounding title, I've got to check this out. And they were talking about this website called Sovereign Man and specifically the proprietor who's, who goes by the uh, moniker Simon Black. And the idea behind the websites for people who want to internationalize their life, um, for open foreign bank accounts, get a dual citizenship, maybe uh, move entirely to a foreign country, that sort of thing. And these people were trying to figure out who this guy is. Is it really what he says it is? Is it a scam? Is it for real? What's going on? And overwhelmingly, the comments were actually extremely negative. I mean, they said some just incredible things about this guy. And right. as I read through this, I said, oh, my goodness, this sounds awful. Mm. Well, now I've at least got to check it out and see for myself. So I took a look at this website and I started reading and it, was, it blew my mind. I mean, the first couple of articles were all about exploring outside your country of origin and really come to think of it. I mean, I'd been in the United States for about, at the time, 26 and a half years. And if you were to ask me why, well, the only honest answer I could give you is, I don't know, just kind of happened to be born here. Right. So at the time, he was offering a workshop in Panama City, and I said, you know what, what the heck, let's do it. So I bought a seat, and I flew out there. And it was an incredible experience. They had residency consultants and bankers and all these expats, every single person with this incredible experience. And I didn't get a single thing done, but it was incredibly, incredibly inspiring. And I just realized, you know what? I don't know why I've closed myself off to the rest of the world. I think I need to do something about this. And so this was February of 2011. I was sitting in a hotel room in Panama City, and I said to myself, that's it. You know what? By the end of 2012, I'm going to be living outside the United States, and I'm going to stay out for at least five years. And then at the end of five years, we'll see. Uh, maybe I'll find a new country to call home, or maybe I'll fall in love with being a permanent traveler. Or I may even end up back in the States. Who knows? But at least then I'd know why I was there. Right. And when did you, uh, when did you leave the U.S.? Day one was September 26, 2012. Um, I didn't actually plan it very well. Um, <laughs> it was, I actually thought I was going to go to Costa Rica um, for, biz for my business. Um, and we were getting ready to do that. It would be like right at the end of the year, like maybe in December, uh, right around there. And one day I was at a Starbucks in California and a friend of mine who I actually never met this guy in person. He, uh, he's been a permanent traveler for almost five years now. And just a random Skype, he said, hey, Phoenix, I'm going to be in Colombia for the next three months. Uh, hey, do you want to get an apartment together or something? And so let's see. Here's a guy. I never met him before. He wants me to go to a foreign country with him. And I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen, right? So I did the only logical thing and said, of course, let's do it. <laughs> right. So and that was your I, first stop. And that was my first stop. I landed day one. I landed in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, it was about 1140 at night. Uh, the airport is about 40 kilometers uh, away from the city, so you travel through like these mountain, mountainous paths. It was foggy. It was a little cold. I still remember. Uh, it like literally felt like I was traveling into the unknown. And here I was in this country where I didn't speak the language. I didn't know the culture. I was a thousand miles away from anything that was even remotely familiar. 
I was in this, I mean, it wasn't like a bad neighborhood, but it was just so different from anything I was used to that it just seemed really shady. Right. And the, the taxi driver couldn't find my hostel. And I had no idea what to do. I, I pulled out my phone, but I mean, who was I going to call? I mean, it was really, I was completely on my own. And it was at that moment that I really discovered, wow, this is what it means to be free. Like, I arrived, it was the start of my adventure and an entire world of possibilities. But at the same time, I was 100% responsible for everything that happened. Right, right. That's awesome. It's uh, such an interesting thing that you've done. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people would find that a very inspiring idea. And uh, I'm definitely keen to talk about the experiences that you had. But maybe if we just take a step back, because especially for people who are considering this, you know, do, what was the practicalities of you in terms of, you mentioned that you were working. What was the practicalities of uh, quitting your job or did you work online or, you know, how did you, how did you actually uh, finance the trip and, and what did you do about work? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it was completely impractical. Um, so at the time I was working for a large uh, advertising agency in Dallas and they do have offices around the world. So I kind of I started there. And I wanted to give them the opportunity to do maybe like a worker exchange or just to uh, facilitate a transfer to an office somewhere else. In fact, there is, in fact, an office in Santiago. And I, I just kind of, Chile kind of was just like, I don't know why it was my first pick. I just kind of really started to be interested in that country. And so I went to my boss and I said, uh, you know, hey, look, this is kind of where my interests are. Uh, can we do something? Either I go down there for six months, we bring somebody else up, or we just do a transfer there. And I just kind of got a sense that they weren't really that interested. Right. And, and I think the thing for me, it's funny, I look at entrepreneurship kind of like I look at riding a motorcycle. Like all my life, I thought it was the coolest thing ever, but I never ever thought that it would be for me. And then one day, almost by accident, in this case of motorcycling, I just kind of, I was looking for something fun to do one weekend, and I saw this class for, like, motorcycle training. I was like, eh, yeah, what the heck, it'll be fun. And the week after, I was at the dealership. And the same thing has been my experience with entre entrepreneurship. Um, I had this job, it was a great job, and as long as I wanted to stay in the U.S., it would have been wonderful. Um, but it wasn't really, I just thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could just get, have my own business, do my own thing? And then one day, sort of out of the blue, my coworker, one of my uh, former coworkers, uh, emails me and says, "Hey, can we meet up for lunch, uh, say tomorrow?" And I say, "Great, you know, sounds great." And he says, "By the way, don't tell anybody." All right, what's the job? And so he introduced me to his team. They had a business idea that they wanted to form. I took a look at it. It sounded really cool, and decided to go for it. Um, I probably, if I if I was going to do it again, I probably wouldn't do it the same way. I did kind of burn a few bridges to shall we say, uh, affect the change faster. Mm. But it did work out. Uh, the company's now uh, doing really well. We're actually getting ready to release our first product. Um, and it's just been, it's been a ton of fun to work for. Cool. So this is a, a startup venture that you got involved in. And um, is that something that you are, is that some, are you currently uh, living from savings until that comes through, or is you already financing your own trip by your entrepreneurial activities? Yeah, so actually, um, as the business is still starting up. So I, I'm actually getting a little bit of money out of that. Um, I guess I'm kind of cheating. Like, I did negotiate with the investors a small salary, just something to cover my bills, um, just because of sort of the uncertainty of my situation, and also just because of the nature of the work I was doing. It was like, when you're doing a software startup, there's a lot of work that has to be done up front by a, mm. certain, ty like, a certain type of person. So we just kind of recognized that, and we negotiated. I negotiated a little bit of a salary. So I've had to do a little bit of freelance work here and there. I am living off a little bit of savings, but uh, for the most part, I've been able to leverage the business to keep the bills paid. I don't think that's cheating at all. I think congratulations. You know, it's it's uh, it's really awesome that you've managed to get that in place because that's a significant life change. Two significant life changes at the same time. You know, that your decision to to leave America and and do the whole traveling thing, as well as leaving salaried employment and going into entrepreneurship. So, it must have been a pretty uh, pretty amazing uh, kind of uh, life change to navigate over the last year. Oh, goodness, it's been a complete disaster. 
Uh, I'd have to say, you know, when I set out, um, I, I said to myself, you know what, I don't know if this is going to work or not, um, and that's okay. Um, maybe, it'll, maybe I'll be a massive success. Maybe it'll be a dismal failure. I have no idea. But I'm pretty sure the one thing it's not going to be is boring. Right. Um, and to that end, it has definitely not been a disappointment. But Absolutely. I did try a whole bunch of ideas um, when I first started out. I wasn't even sure if this software company was going to be it. Um, and I wanted to try a bunch of different things. Um, and I am proud to say that I am the proud owner of three distinct failures uh, so far. Um, I, start, I wanted to start a, a clothing import business in Paraguay, which uh, went beautifully until both of us, uh, myself and my partner decided we didn't want to do it. Right. Um, I tried doing some gig finding. I assembled a small network of uh, service providers, residency consultants, and uh, executive assistant translators people. And that would have done beautifully, but I focused too much on trying to find the money, and I ended up, uh, shall we say, destroying a lot of relationships before they had a chance to form. Right. Uh, and then I did try to do some freelance work to do like my own agency, and uh, well, when you're starting out, you have a bit of a credibility problem, so uh, that one is not going to go, that's not going to go anywhere. Well, I think what's really interesting in the way that you talk about those uh, those experiences is that you know you obviously haven't been um, deterred or like uh, haven't thought about giving up, and so like, I think that's really really important. Uh, you know, in terms of the uh, the the opportunity that you have to continue, that you those those experiences haven't stopped you, and and uh, a lot of people would find that very disheartening. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, what what it was like and how how you managed to turn that into, you know, a useful experience rather than something that made you give up? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And it was it was terrifying. In some in some ways, it still is um, because I think when I first started out, um, I was really really afraid that I would do this and fail like in a very big way. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it, like at the time that wasn't it. It was money. It was, I might not be able to get a job. It was like, there were all these logistical problems, but I wasn't trying that hard to find solutions for them. And I think what it really was, was, yeah, I was just really afraid that if I went out there and I stood up by myself and I left my safety net behind, I left everything familiar behind and it was just me in the world that I would just fail. I would be totally, uh, like I would, wouldn't be able to do it. I would find out I'm just deficient or there's something wrong with me or I'm just not cut out for it. And sure enough, I mean, day one, for crying out loud, I'm, I'm here in the middle of, as far as I'm concerned, I'm in the middle of nowhere. And what am I going to do? Am I, like, I can't get to my hostel. Am I going to just walk around? Am I going to sleep in the street? Who knows? Uh, and the, host, uh, the taxi driver did eventually find my hostel, by the way. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you how that story ended, actually. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, in that area of Medellin, there's just a ton of one-way streets. And we eventually figured it out, and then I showed up. And, and then I got to the hostel, and nobody spoke English. It was fantastic. Um, <laughs> but really, over the, the course of those like, first few weeks, I found myself in all kinds of situations that I just never, ever encountered before. And what I came to realize was I'm a lot smarter than I thought and I'm a lot more capable than I thought and more creative than I thought and stronger than I thought. Like, and in ways that I never even thought were possible before, like, I just realized almost immediately that I can rely on myself. And if I find myself in these weird situations that I've never found, like never encountered before, shoot, I can figure it out and I, I can thrive out here. That's awesome. I think that's really, really a fantastic attitude. And so, tell us about the blog. You know, what what's the idea behind um, behind uh, the writing that you're doing? Oh, the blog. You know, I never really wanted to do a blog. I I really before I left, all my friends were you know take pictures. We want to live vicariously through you. And I'm like, why don't you live vicariously by doing it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but I said, all right, fine. All right, tell you what, I'll post I'll post on Facebook. But that's it. Just maybe once a day, like just what I'm feeling. I'm not. I'm not doing a blog. I'm not. I don't want to do it. I'm not doing a blog. Uh, I'll take. Okay, fine. I'll take some photos. Fine. Uh, but that's it. No promises. And sure enough, day one. By that point, it was probably like one in the morning. So technically, it was day two. But don't tell anybody. Um, 
I opened up my laptop and I did a little post. And um, I wasn't a very good writer back then, uh, <laughs> but I did kind of like it. And I kept going on day two and day three and day four. And before I knew it, I had like 20 days under my, under my belt and I'd taken a few photos. And it was kind of cool. I was having some fun. Uh, I liked being out there taking the photos and you know, all important. And around day 30 or so, I, I left uh, Colombia and I was in uh, Paraguay. And I was at my hostel, and I started getting requests from people, like on Facebook. People wanted to friend me. I'd never met these people before in my life, but I guess somehow they heard that I was doing an international trip, and they wanted to follow me. And I didn't really feel comfortable friending them on Facebook. That seems a little weird, but I thought, all right, well, ah, what the heck? If I'm going to have a blog, then I might as well have a blog. And so I went domain shopping, and I found fiveyearsabroad.com, and that's eh, kind of catchy. Let's do it. And I set up a blogger account, and was up till three in the morning importing all my content and getting the design just right and fiddling with all the, the text and getting feedback from people. And it was, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, it's kind of like the business owner who is up until three in the morning, like handling the minutiae of the product where you, any normal person would look at them and go, what are you doing? Yeah, right. But I was, I mean, I was, I was having just a heck of a time with it. And, and I kept it up. I did a post every single day and I got all dramatic, you know, day 35 of 1827 and day 40 of 1827. And surprisingly, I've had material almost every single day. I don't understand how that is. I really would have thought things would have gotten boring by now, but things just keep happening to me. Awesome. So what are the countries that you have, you've lived in uh, so far then? All right. So... I started out, uh, the first three weeks were in, uh, in Colombia, and I, I was just in Medellin. Uh, my friend, true to his word, we got an apartment for a couple of weeks, and he helped me uh, tremendously. Um, I, I'd have to say, like, without his help, I still could have made it work, but he just kind of, like, all the, all the really tricky stuff when you're first starting out, he helped uh, make all those problems go away. Um, so massive credit to him. Um, once that was done, then I flew down to Asuncion in Paraguay uh, with a stopover in Panama City because I like direct flights. <laughs> and I was there for a couple of weeks. That was really just to set up residency there. Um, I figured that Paraguay would kind of be a, a destination for me. Uh, maybe I'd stay there for a longer period of time. But I just kind of did a quick stopover, get the residency set up, and just check the city out. Right. Uh, from there, I went to Chile, um, and I spent about three months in Chile. Uh, that was like that was my first long term. Like I said, I kind of had my eye on it to begin with, so that was going to be my first um, like sort of long term visit. And I was in Santiago. I went down to Talca. I was in Viña del Mar. Um, spent about three months. And then around that point, something very interesting happened. Uh, and a lot of people say this happens around that point. This was like right around I think four months, five months, somewhere right in there. And I started to feel homesick, like. I kind of was, I felt like I was done traveling. Like up until this point, it was like three months or a mu uh, three weeks in every city and then I'd switch and then three weeks here and three weeks there. And I, I kind of wanted to calm down and, and, and just settle somewhere for a bit. And so by that point, my residency in Paraguay had gone through. So I thought, okay, well, hey, let's have some fun. Let's go live in Paraguay for like a year. And I transitioned back over. I rented a house. I got my finances established there. I got a bank account. Uh, technically, I also got a job there, but that was just for the bank account. Again, don't tell anybody. Um, and it was a complete and utter disaster. Um, Paraguayan culture is very, very different than anything I'd ever encountered before. Um, not to say that it's better or worse. It just takes a certain kind of person to really flourish there, and I'm just not that kind of person. But what was very interesting about that was around week three, when I just realized I couldn't handle it anymore and had to get the heck out of there, um, I got that homesick feeling again. But this time, I wasn't homesick for the United States. I was homesick for Santiago, Chile. Right. And that was it. I hopped back on a plane, and I'm, I'm, I'm here, and I'm, in, and I'm in Santiago, and uh, I'm taking a quick, quick trip to Buenos Aires in just a couple of days, but when I come back, um, I'm going to establish my business here. I'm going to apply for residency. Who knows? Maybe citizenship. Um, like I've really fallen in love with Chile. Mm. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear um, of your experience. You mentioned that Paraguay just, you know, you, you really need to be a certain type of person. Uh, what was the issue with Paraguay? Because I've never been there. So, what was it? Uh, what was it like? Oh uh, yeah. So in Paraguay, 
everything runs on relationships. Like, and the way I put it to some people is, look, in every country, everywhere you go, if you know the right people, things get done faster. In Paraguay, if you know the right people, things get done at all. Right. And so if you're the kind of person, if you can form strategic relationships and you like to uh, like form these really close bonds with everybody, um, you can do really, really well there. And to be sure, Paraguayans can be incredibly friendly. Um, they treat everybody like family. And I've seen people just go to incredible lengths to make sure their friends are taken care of. If they ever need a favor, like they're there for each other in a heartbeat. And that's amazing to watch. The problem is, though, if you're a guy like me, I need rules, I need structure, I need organic relationships. Like, I can't be friends with somebody just because he can help me out with something. We yeah. have to share values. Sure. And I just kind of found myself, like, on the outside. And I think, I think the, uh, I don't remember, I don't remember how they put it, but, like, I felt like I was being eaten alive out there. Hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. So it's very much um, one of those places where you need to kind of get in with the, the right circles and, I mean, basically schmooze people in order to get things done, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of my, my, favorite, my favorite experiences, we were getting the internet uh, service set up at my house and we were talking to the internet company. Now, I have a friend in the city and she knows everybody. I mean, it is really cool to watch her work. When she walks into a place, she either knows everybody there or she does by the time she leaves. Right. And she had a friend at the internet company and the guy, shoot, had I been in his area, I would have had internet service set up that day. Like within two hours, the guys would have been at the home setting the thing up. Um, I wasn't in his area and we didn't know anybody who serviced where my house was. And it took a week uh, of, oh yeah, we'll be there tomorrow. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, you will definitely be there tomorrow. You're on our list. We'll definitely be there on Monday. Uh, Tuesday, yeah, we'll be there. And then finally, I think my friend called up their customer service center and claimed to know the CEO and threatened to get half the company fired. And then someone was there in a few hours. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but that is kind of how things work there. And like I said, I mean, if, if you're the kind of person who thrives in that environment, then you will really love that, that, that culture in that country. Yeah. Um, I'm just not that kind of person. Now, I did um, a chat with um, Edwin about uh, Chile, and he, he's based there and uh, is very much a fan of the opportunities in Chile. And it sounds like Chile is the place that you've kind of gravitated towards as well. Um, and is that your feeling on it at the moment, that you, you think Chile's a, a good opportunity if you're intending to uh, expatriate as a place to go to? Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, I really love Chile. Um, it is one of the, it, well, uh, now to be fair, I've only visited like four countries. However, of those four, and that includes the United States, I think it is the freest country I've been to so far, um, both politically, economically. There is a, an energy here that I just never felt. No, oh, that's not fair. I wasn't feeling around the time I left the United States. I wasn't feeling it there. Um, right. And I feel it here. You come to Santiago and Within a week of arriving, I had networked with entrepreneurs and professionals and all these people who are coming to this country to create things and build things. I mean, it's a fantastic feeling to be down here. That's really cool. And in terms of the sort of practicalities, how have you found costs in Chile compared to uh, Paraguay and uh, Colombia? Oh, man, I was loving Colombia and Paraguay. I mean... In those countries, I got used to saying, what is this, $5 for dinner? What am I made of money? Come on. <laughs> and then I got to Santiago and my first meal was like $8. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> um, and actually, that was one of the reasons why, uh, w another one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Paraguay is because it is so incredibly inexpensive to live there. Uh, I mean, you could, you could live like, maybe not a king, but mm, uh, like a prince of a small municipality for like $1,000 a month. Mm. Um, and... Um, and, but Chile is, is manageable. I think it's fairly comparable. There are some things like rent is actually a lot less here. Um, I think utilities are less. But things like, and especially in Santiago, just because it's like the, the capital city and, and it is a big city, things are more expensive here. Um, but I'd say costs are pretty comparable. I was living in uh, the Dallas area in, in the United States. Um, and for the most part, I think my money goes right around as far here as it did back up there. Right, so you're saying that uh, Chile, and this is kind of my experience, that Chile is not really a place to go if you want to uh, be amazed at how cheap you can live. It's kind of, it's, it's going to be um, similar costs with maybe some 
some things that you can get cheaper if you if you want to, so to speak. Right. Um, a few things like I think food in the city is actually a little more expensive, but then things like cell service is actually a little less expensive. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah. And what is your um, thoughts about Argentina? Are you just going there to visit, or um, are you thinking about that as another place? At the moment, it's just to visit. Um, it's actually what's funny is on my way to Paraguay, I figured, hey, I've never taken an international bus trip before. Let's do that. Um, and that's, I forget which days those are, but they're pretty memorable. It was one of the most difficult experiences of my life. Um, I never really gave Argentina a fair shake. Um, the one time I visited it, I was in transit and really not feeling like traveling. Um, this time I am going to travel there. I'm with going to go with a group this time um, and really have some fun there. And uh, not to date this episode, but if those storms don't go away, we're really going to have an exciting time. Right. Uh, <laughs> but um, as far as living there goes, I'd be curious um, just to see what it's like. And by all means, as much as I love Chile, let's be honest, we're only six months in. Mm. Um, day one, six months was uh, March 26th, and that was I still got four and a half years to go. So even if I do go for even if I go for citizenship in Chile, well, you know, I, I can still leave the country about six months out of the year. So for sure, I'm not done exploring yet. So yeah, yeah. My experience of it was that it, I mean, uh, Buenos Aires is an amazing city and a really, really beautiful city that you can. It's also got great um, streets with cafes and bars and a you know, real sense of uh, an urban culture there, which is which is fantastic. But the thing about Argentina at the moment is the capital controls are just such a, a pain in the ass. And just right. getting money uh, is, is a, a major issue. And you also get the sense that things are really going downhill fast in terms of the, the kind of uh, um, economic meltdown that's happening with all of the capital controls and things that the government is doing there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it happens... Um, every ten years or so in in Argentina, and maybe soon it'll it'll get sorted out and be uh, and be a lot easier to live there. But I found that to be a, a bit of an unfortunate downside, because if it wasn't for that, I think Buenos Aires is a just a great place to live. Yeah, I am looking forward to taking a look and seeing what it's like. Um, I have I have no idea what it's like to live there. I've certainly read a lot, and I've heard some I've heard stories both from people who have lived there and who have visited. Um, and I think, if nothing else, yeah, just the fact that it is so different, even from even relative to South America, from what I've heard, mm. uh, I'm just really excited to check it out. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you briefly about language, because I mean, one of the great opportunities with South America is that if you do learn Spanish, then you know you can just go anywhere and, and use it. But you, I think you said you didn't speak any Spanish when you arrived. So what's your experience been of uh, of, of learning Spanish, and how's that going? Yeah, it's to be honest, the first couple of weeks were really hard. Um, I did not know any, enough Spanish to, to do anything. And I, I, will, I will admit right now, uh, I got it. I got totally intimidated. And my first couple of weeks, there were nights where I, I thought to myself, oh, man, I'm hungry. But if I go out there, I have to talk in Spanish. Um, I'll just go to bed early. It's fine. No, I'll eat tomorrow or something. And I did. And I, I okay. I mean, it, it is what it is. But now, uh, within a couple of months, honestly, within a couple of weeks, that goes away because, well, you know, you have to eat. Um, and then after a couple of months, no problem. I can navigate the restaurants. I can go to shops. Uh, in fact, and now I'm at six months, and goodness, I, I called customer service for my cell phone to set up uh, mobile data, actually, like right before this call. So when you start learning, you think, you know, I'm going to get through, I'm going to get through my lessons and then like, like, it'll be like a switch will flip and you'll suddenly understand everything, or at least that's how I thought it would be. And it's not like that at all. Um, you just start understanding a little bit more and a little bit more and you learn a new word here and a new word there and you learn this expression. And before you know it, like somebody will say something to you and you'll totally understand what they mean. And I'm not even at the point where I understand the words. I just understand what they mean. And I'm, thankful just for that right, right. Um, and and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen I had a great encounter about a month ago I was with a friend of mine and she had to go buy some cigarettes and she picked the cigarettes up and she was looking for a light and she stopped some guy on the street and she asked him for a light and this is of course all in Spanish and the guy said he said something and then he found he found his lighter and he, he lit her cigarette and then he turned to me and he asked me something. He was talking so fast, I couldn't understand. But I, I just said, no, 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 that's Libyan. 
And he laughed and he shook my hand and patted me on the shoulder and, and he walked off. And my friend turned to me and she said, Phoenix, do you understand what just happened? And I said, I, I think so. And she says, okay, tell me what happened. And I said, okay. So you asked him for a light and he, helped, he gave you a light and then he turned to me and he asked me if I needed one too. And I said, no, 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 I'm fine. It's Libyan. <laughs> and, he, and he congratulated me for, you know, well, you know, because like some, you know, some smokers will do that. So, you know, I'm, I so admire you for not smoking. I wish I, you know, whatever, I, I could do that too. And he walked off. And she says, oh, Phoenix, I asked him for a light. And then he said, oh, I'm always on fire for you, baby. And then he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm drunk. And he gave me a light. And then he turned to you and he said, uh, I'm so sorry that I hit on your, I hit on your girlfriend. Um, are, are we cool? And I said, no, 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 it's fine. It's Libyan. <laughs> and he's like, oh, thank you, thank you. And he walked off. <laughs> so, you know, and, but the best part about all this is, is like, you know, when this stuff happens, this, is, this makes such a great story for the blog that I really don't even care. It's just so much fun. Yeah. Well, I think it's great because a lot of people, again, just thinking about people who are listening to this, you know, they find it a bit intimidating, the, the whole, uh, I'm going to have to learn a foreign language and stuff. But if you're, willing, mm -hmm. if you're willing to have that experience of being totally incompetent at something, mm -hmm. as, as we all are when we go and learn another language, if, you, if you're willing to just go through that and you know, kind of enjoy it for the, most, for the best you can, then you do come out the other side pretty quickly and, and find that your competence slowly grows and then you know, you've got this really fantastic tool that you can now use in any country and the ability to, to get all over South America with it. Exactly. And actually, the same thing happened with entrepreneurship for me. Um, I, so I was a careerist for about 11 years. I uh, worked as a software en uh, engineer for a bunch of different companies. And when you've been doing something for 11 years, you start developing some instincts. You get a feel for how things work. And when I switched and I started my own company and I started dealing with that side of things and trying to find customers and all that, uh, I went with my gut because, shoot, for the last 11 years, that's what I've been doing. Mm. And... I, of course, I didn't know anything, so I got it all wrong, and disastrously so. Um, but I think what's really interesting about that, um, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, I've, I read a lot of Derek Siver's work, um, mm. and he talks a lot about taking responsibility for even failures that seem like completely out of your control. It's like if you take responsibility for them, that empowers you, because then you, you can do something about it. Right. Right. Like, if these things happen and you have no control over them, well, then what, what can you do? I mean, mm. then things are just going to keep happening and you, all you can do is hope <laughs> that, that, that they just turn around and start working for you. Um, but if you really take ownership over your failures, over when things blow up in your face, and even like little things, like even if it's like, man, this guy just, the guy in Paraguay at the house, I mean, he basically cheated me out of $5,000. Um, yeah. But, man, I really could have done some better due diligence on this guy. I mean, he was like a fourth degree connection for crying out loud. Right. Um, and having the blog also helps, too, just because then I can turn it into a really funny story. But for sure, like, the failures and the humiliations and the embarrassments, like, they were really hard at first. I'm not even going to try to, to push that aside. They are really difficult. It is really painful sometimes to have to deal with this stuff for sure. Um, but once you can get past that and you can take responsibility for it and, and even laugh about it or turn it into a really funny story, it is just incredibly empowering. You're going to get so much respect from your peers and your friends and uh, anybody that you work with um, and from yourself, most importantly. Um, and you just will look and say, wow, <laughs> six months ago, I could barely talk and now I'm navigating the city. I'm acting as a, an interpreter for my friends who are visiting. It's like you, when you start from nothing, you just have, there's no limit to how far you can go. I think that's awesome. And I think your, your uh, project and your experience is uh, really inspiring for people. So just to finish up, I wonder, you know, what, what thoughts you have in terms of things that were unexpected or lessons that you've learned that you would like to share with anybody who's considering doing something similar to what you're doing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think the most important thing that I would say is if you're the kind of person who is interested in this, if like your mind works in that way that the idea of immersing yourself in a foreign culture, no matter how scary, no matter how impossible it seems, if you have that interest then I guarantee you have the personality type and you have that drive to make it work. 
And I don't mean that you're going to come out here and be a big hit immediately. I don't mean that things aren't going to go wrong. What I mean by that is the kind of person who is interested in putting himself into completely unfamiliar situations and having to rely on himself to survive is the kind of person who, when he's in a completely unfamiliar situation, he can rely on himself to survive. Right. So the, like, the one piece of advice that I, would, that I would stress is if you're thinking about doing this, then two things. Number one, you can. It will happen. You are totally capable of doing it. It's going to be a heck of a ride. Um, but you're going to emerge from the, on the other side. And the other thing that I would say is you also know exactly what you need to do to make it happen. Um, this one's a little bit, maybe this one's a little bit more just me. Um, but for me, I knew exactly what it was that I needed to do to make this, uh, dream a reality. And I knew what it was because it was the one thing that I was the most terrified of doing. Um, in my case, actually, it's, this is going to sound a little weird, but I actually I bought a subscription to Sovereign Man Confidential. That was actually my first step. Right. Um, and the reason why, I mean, you know, so, there's a lot of controversy over is, is it a good value, is it whatever. That wasn't important to me. What was important to me was I had money on the table. I had sunk some cash into this, and that for me was my signal that I knew that I was serious about this. Right. And it's probably something different for every person. Like, I guarantee, like, if you're thinking about doing this, step one is not getting on a plane. Um, step one might be opening a bank account for, for travel expenses and putting a certain amount every month. Um, it may be sending your resume to an international headhunter. It could be um, just shopping for apartments online. Like Whatever it is, or maybe it is buying that ticket but for a date and setting that deadline. Like Whatever it is, it's probably the one thing that you are absolutely terrified of doing. And my suggestion to you is that go for it because if you – First of all, I guarantee you'll be able to make it work, but also think about it. If you can't even do that one thing that scares you in your country of origin when you're surrounded by your community and your family and your friends and everything that you've ever known and is familiar to you, then you'll never be able to do it out in the real world. <laughs> out in the real world, sorry. Out in the <laughs> out in, outside, outside of all that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. That's really fantastic. And uh yeah, I think, it'll, as I say, it'll be really inspiring for people. So for people who would like to follow your, your trip and, and learn more about what you're doing, uh, where can they find your blog? Awesome. So the URL is fiveyearsabroad.com. And yes, you can spell out five or use the number. Um, enough people have asked me. I just went ahead and bought both. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm also uh, I'm on, I'm on Facebook, facebook.com slash fiveyearsabroad. Uh, that one you do have to spell out. Um, uh, you, can, you can read the blog at fiveyearsabroad.com. That one's a lot of fun. If you want to see some of the photos that maybe didn't make the blog, because I take a lot more photos, but I only do one photo per day. So there's a lot that don't make it. So if you want to check those out um, or you just want to chat, a lot of my friends end up on there. So you can just chat with some of my friends or with me. Um, and I'm also on Twitter, although I still haven't quite figured out how to use it, but everyone said I should have it, so um, I do. Uh, and that's also twitter.com slash fiveyearsabroad. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Phoenix. It's been a real pleasure uh, having you on the show. Same here, Jake. I'm, I'm a huge fan, and I'm really, I'm really happy to uh, have had this opportunity. Great. And I'll, if, if I can also, I just want to give a quick shout-out to my friend Kevin for introducing me to the series. Uh, thanks, a lot. thanks so much, Kevin. This, has been, th this podcast has really helped a lot. So props to you, man. Well, I appreciate that, both to you and Kevin. And, uh, yeah, so that's great. Thanks, Phoenix. All right. Thanks, Jake. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.